Hello there. Welcome to the fourth and final lesson in the Read Like a Grown-Up video course. In the last lesson, we discussed how to make sense of our reading through analysis and a reading journal. Then I showed you how I analyzed Ernest Hemingway's Big Two-Hearted River in my own personal reading journal. In this lesson, we are going to learn how to apply our reading in two ways. First, by creating a book bones, a summary document that brings all of our reading and thinking together in one place. And secondly, by talking through our reading with a reading partner. And when we do these two steps, we're going to find that our reading really begins to change our life. So what is a book bones? Well, by the time you've reached the fourth step, you've read and annotated your book, you've written summaries and responses, and you've done a final analysis of the book's message. Now you need to pull together all of this reading and thinking and writing together into one place. And to do this, we'll write a book bones. Well, a book bones is a two-page document summarizing your reading, writing, and thinking. It pulls together the best material from the reading process, your best insights, your analysis, your applications. A book bones really is just a skeleton of the book's contents, themes, and insights. Uh, just as a skeleton uh, is, well, the, the book bones really describes the skeleton of the book. It's not a substitute for the book itself, which is something to keep in mind. When we read, we don't want to just pull out uh, the key ideas and the key insights and treat everything else as if it's fluff and, and, and uh, insignificant um, padding for the real, the real meaning of the book. We, skeletons are grotesque without flesh. And in the same way, a book bones isn't all that attractive apart from the book itself. Book bones are never a substitute for, uh, for a book. They're never... Uh, the, they aren't the end goal of reading, really. It's the end of the process, but it's really, it's, a book bones is a, is a summary of the most important um, uh, material from your reading process. So it's important to keep that in mind. A book bones is also, though, a very valuable re resource for later reference. By pulling out your book bones, you can easily remember your reading of the book by simply reviewing this two-page document. Book bones have four distinct parts. They, they are no more than two pages long. And on page one, we have a quick summary, key insights, and personal applications. And on page two, we have all the important quotes from the book. Let's talk about each of these parts individually. The quick summary is simply a summary of how the theme or argument develops in the book. If you've been following the Read Like a Grown-Up method, you've already written the quick summary in your reading journal. We did that in the last lesson. So you can just copy and paste it into your book bones. Key Insights is a list of the most important points from your reading notes, the, key, the, the concepts, ideas, and arguments that outline the author's message. You want to write these down in bullet point paragraphs, and you want to write them as clearly and articulately as possible. This, this type of writing actually will help sharpen your thinking as you try to find exactly the right words to express your thoughts and, and analysis. And we'll take a look at what key insights look like in a minute. The third, as, the third part of Book Bones is uh, personal application. And when you come to personal application, you, after you've done all of your analysis and summary and response to the book, you want to ask yourself, what is this book requiring of me? What's this book demanding that I change? Personal applications need to be three things, concrete, specific, and measurable. Otherwise, the application that you write down isn't going to be actionable. It's not going to be something that you can actually do. So by concrete, concrete actions or concrete applications mean that they should be tangible actions. So you don't want to just write down, I need to be a nicer person. That's not that concrete. Instead, you could say, I need to speak encouraging words instead of snarky ones. Speaking encouraging words is far more concrete than I just need to be nice. Specific means being as precise as possible in these actions. So a specific action would be, I need to speak encouraging words to my kids instead of always barking at them to clean their rooms. That's far more specific even than just saying I need to speak encouraging words. This is telling us who we, whom we need to speak those words to, and in what situations. Lastly, your application should be measurable, which means that you should be able to tell when these actions are done. So building off our previous example, we might write, I will find three ways to encourage my children with my words today. 
I will watch closely for them to do something right, then draw attention to it to encourage them. So notice we're saying three ways, far more measurable, and we're saying today. It has to be done today, this very day. A very much, uh, much more measurable application than we had before. We're also discussing the methods that we'll use. We'll watch them closely until they do something right and then draw attention to it in order to encourage them. So that's a concrete, specific, and measurable application, and that's what we're going for when we uh, think it through our application. And the fourth part of the book bones uh, is the important quotes. The important quotes are, are the most significant quotes that you found uh, as you annotated your book and as you worked through your reading notes. Important quotes are important in one of two ways. First, they are the quotes that illustrate or develop the themes of the story, or they are quotes that contain a good deal of wisdom in themselves that somehow spoke to you or, or struck a chord as you read them, and you want to remember them for later reference. So we'll put those in the book bone so we can reference them later. A couple of things that are to keep in mind about important quotes, you really want to limit yourself to one page of quotes. This is a good reason why you should do book bones in a word processing program rather than just in a notebook. The reason you want to limit yourself to one page of quotes is that it forces you to find the really key quotes. If you have only one page uh, and you have, if you have only one page to use and you actually have three pages of quotes, you'll, you're going to have to sift through those three pages to find the really significant uh, passages of the book. Also be sure to include page numbers so that you can find those quotes again later. That's all, that's all that's involved in, in writing a book bones. Quick summary, key insights, personal applications, all of those on the first page, and then the second page is important quotes. The benefit of this, of doing a book bones, is that it, it, has you, it forces you to go back over all of your reading and analysis and, re, and reading notes and really crystallize what you think the book's message is, how the author conveys that, and how it, it's going to affect your life. Now what I want to do is, is actually walk you through how I write my book bones, and we'll do that for Hemingway's The Big Two-Hearted River. If you'd like to take a break now, pause the video, stretch, get a drink, and I'll see you in just a few minutes. Let's talk about how I make my book bones. I always use a word processor for book bones for two reasons. First of all, a word processor has a lot better formatting options than Evernote. Secondly, a word processor program is it makes it easier to limit myself to the page restraints that are a vital part of uh, of the book bones process. When I write a book bones, I actually I actually have a template called the book bones template, uh, and it, when I click on that, it opens up a, a pre formatted document that has all of the necessary elements uh, for a book bones, and then I can very quickly uh, enter in all of the details. Um, th that are going to be in this book bones and I save it uh, with the appropriate title and I'm ready to go. All right, so I have the information, the, the author, the title, the date, um, and I've included it here in the header as well. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, I would save it as the Big Two-Hearted River or, or Big Two-Heart uh, Book Bones, something like along those lines. And now I'm going to go ahead and, and fill out my quick summary in Key Insights. As I mentioned already, we've already written our quick summary. It's in our uh, reading notes. We talked about it last in the last lesson. So we'll go ahead and uh, pull that up. Here's our quick summary, a uh, quick summary paragraph. It's a summary of how the, the theme develops the, or the themes for the story develop through the plot. Um, we're going to copy that and we'll go on. We'll go back to the quick summary and paste it in. Next, moving on to key insights. Remember, key insights are the most important details. Uh, the most important uh, elements of the story. And when, if you're following a fictional story like we are here, you really want to write them down in the order uh, uh, that, they, that they occur. So chronological order according to the story. That's the best way to go about doing this. Well, in this particular story, the first, the first important part of the theme development is recognizing Nick's crisis of heart. Um, and that happens from the very beginning of the story when he sees the burned over town, we know that he's longing for some kind of peace. Uh, we see how he connects to the grasshoppers, how he connects himself to the grasshoppers. So we'll write something along those lines, something that captures that aspect of the story. And here's, uh, here's wh what my book bones usually look like. If you don't feel like writing as much as this, that's fine. I, I try to write down a fairly complete paragraph uh, that summarizes this, this part of the book. 
and you can download my book bones in the resources section. I'm not going to walk you through this text, but that's the first point that I want to talk about in this book is just how Nick's crisis, and we recognize that uh, that he's hoping that um, that his time with the river at the river, camping around the in the green country around the river, is going to bring healing to his burned over soul. So that's the first the first of our key insights. The next important part of this story. Uh, occurs when Nick makes camp. That is a, a very vital part of the story, uh, and we want to capture that somehow in our book bones. And so I would write something along these lines, um, talking about how Nick deliberately tries to make a good place where nothing can touch him. Uh, his meal is very sacramental. His exclamation, his incarnational exclamation, uh, the the coffee according to Hopkins, and just pointing out that, that this is all Nick's gospel. He's trying to somehow bring together his fra- the two parts of his fractured life, trying to make his present uh, match up with the goodness that, that he experienced in his past. Uh, the next important part of the story is Nick's fishing experience. I would, so I would discuss why he, or what he hopes to accomplish in the fishing, that it, it seems to be more baptismal or more sacramental imagery with the river being baptism. But I'd also talk about how Nick uh, actually discovers several elements of, or several, several images of death. And how that, that doesn't quite ruin his fishing, but the final image of the swamp, the tragic fishing in the swamp, challenges Nick's uh, new sacrament of fishing. And building on that theme, the, the next key insight that I would talk about is how is what Nick does with that reality when he realizes that even here in this good place, even with the, the, the new life that the river seems to be giving him, there's still a threat of death. And this is, of course, the famous double heart of the river, the two hearts. And so we've got to put something in our book bones about the title of the story, why it's called the Big Two-Hearted River, uh, and how Nick realizes that the river both gives life but can also take life away. And finally, I want to put down my as my very last key insight what I think Hemingway's central theme is uh, in this story. And for, from my perspective, from my reading, his theme is simply that there are no utopias, there are no good places that death cannot touch. And the best thing that he, that humans can do is to build the best places they can for themselves, recognizing from the beginning that they're going to be flawed and fairly flimsy. And that is the key insights. Five, in this case, I have five, uh, five central points in the story that really explain to me the development of the plot, how Hemingway constructs the story, why I think it's effective, and um, and what the central theme is of the book. Then we go on to personal application. These need to be concrete, specific, and measurable. And from my reading of the story, one of the one of the major uh, points of application that that occurs to me is uh, that that rituals are inescapable. Rituals are an inescapable part of human life. I said, I need to be more aware of the rituals I use to shape my world and need to evaluate how they are shaping me. And if you were, if you were paying attention previously, you'll say, you should say, hey, that's, that's uh, not all that specific or measurable, and you're correct. So I need to, I need to tweak this somehow so that it is both specific and, and uh, measurable. Now notice that this is, even though it's not even though it's not specific or measurable, it is fairly concrete. It has to do, it has to do with becoming aware of the rituals I use to shape my world. So how can I make that more specific? I could add some text here, but what I would probably do since I have some space is simply add on uh, how I'm going to go about specifically and, and measurably identifying what those rituals are. So I, I might do something like spend 10 minutes every night for the next five nights just journaling, thinking through the rituals of that day. How did I speak to my kids today at the breakfast table? How did I plan my work? How did I speak to my boss? How did I speak to my students? And then how did I spend my evening? Uh, Aristotle uh, once said somewhere that you can tell a lot about a man by how he spends his leisure time. And so how did I spend my evening? Did I, did I use it um, reading and, and uh, communicating with other people? Or did I spend it you know, watching watching TV and uh, kind of just frittering it away. And not only is it important how I spent my time or what I did with my time, but also how I did those things. And so I would I would just t- take some time thinking through all of those. Notice that it is uh, I'm specific. I will spend ten minutes every night. It's measurable for the next uh, for the next five nights. 
and then I'm doing something. I'm, I, and as I'm thinking through those, uh, thinking during those 10 minutes, I'm also processing my rituals for the day. So there's my personal application. I might add, I'd probably add a third port, a third point here. What am I going to do when I'm done with these five nights? I'll probably uh, assess which rituals I have that I need to change or I need to get rid of which rituals are shaping me in a negative direction. And then I would make a plan for it, for uh, replacing those with rituals that are shaping me in a positive direction. Then we move on to important quotes. And again, important quotes are going to be any quotes that uh, really helped illustrate or, de- or develop the themes of the story or quotes that stood out to me as being uh, pithy and full of wisdom, things that I want to remember for later. So here are, are a few examples of what these quotes might be. Nick, so from the beginning of the story, Nick looked at the burned out stretch of hillside where he had expected to find the scattered houses of the town and then walked down the railroad track to the bridge over the river. The river was there. That's right from the very first paragraph of the story. We're contrasting Nick's uh, disappointed expectation in in the burned over town. It's not there, but the river is reliable. The river is there. And then some more examples here. Uh, Nick's uh, exclamation when he has his first spoonful from the plate uh, in, in his meal of pork and beans and canned spaghetti. Um, the gospel accord or the coffee according to Hopkins. All important, uh, important quotes. And then the end, of course, the swamp. It would not be possible to walk through a swamp like that. Nick did not want to go in there now. Uh, he didn't want to go down the stream any further today. And then, of course, the very last sentence of the story, there were plenty of days coming when you could fish the swamp. So those are my important quotes. You can check them out in the resources section where I include a copy of, of this exact document, My Book Bones. Go down there and, and, and you can learn a lot from just looking at someone else's, how someone else reads a book and, and keeps his own notes. So go check that out and uh, we'll return to the, the rest of the tutorial. We have, after we've finished our book bones, we now need to talk about a reading partner. After you've written your book bones, one of the best things you can do to really own your reading is to talk about the book with another human being. And the best person to talk to is your reading partner. Someone who has read the same book as you and read it in the same way. As you talk through the book you find, with your partner, you'll find that you benefit from your reading partner's reactions, insights, and analysis. Reading partners always improve your reading, even if you disagree with everything your partner says. The most important benefit, though, of a reading partner comes when you, when you start thinking about application. Your reading partner helps you verify that you've read the book in the right way and that your assessment of the author's message is correct. And together, the two of you can not only make your application of a book more concrete and specific, but you can also hold each other accountable to follow through with the changes that the book has required of you. So don't skip over this step. It's really easy to do, but the the mere... The mere act of talking about your, your reading with someone, even if that person hasn't read your book, or hasn't read the same book, um, maybe your long-suffering spouse will, uh, will, will humor you by letting you talk about the book. The mere act of talking about what you've been reading and thinking about and, and trying to apply to your own life will help crystallize it in your own mind. It will sharpen your thinking. It will pull together threads of thought that you didn't realize were connected, and it will make your reading much, much better. And the best way to do that is to find a reading partner. Reading partners can be hard to find, and they're even harder to hold on to. But uh, if you persevere, you'll find someone who's interested in reading the books, and your your uh, reading will improve tenfold. So don't skip over that step. Uh, that's a very important part of the reading like a grown-up method. That's it. That is the fourth and final step of the read like a grown-up method. So what's next? You now have all the tools necessary to read like a grown-up. That doesn't mean, of course, that every book will magically reveal its secrets to you, but it does mean that you have the tools to read in a way that makes sense of the author's message and will actually change your life as you read. So the first thing you should go on to do after you finish this course is to keep working your way through the reading list that you set up in Lesson 1. As you read, annotate and then write summary, summary paragraphs and responses to each major section and a summary paragraph for the entire book. Then answer the final analysis questions in your reading journal. And lastly, write a book bones for the book and then talk through it with someone. Hopefully that's a reading partner. 
Now, the more you practice this method, the easier it will become, just like any skill worth developing. This journey will be difficult at first, though, and I have some other resources to help you on your way, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. But I want to remind you to keep in mind that the Read Like a Grown-Up method is a method that you would use for any book that you really want to get a hold of, that you really want to make a part of yourself. You will not use the Read Like a Grown-Up method for every single book you read. When you're at the beach reading through some uh, through the the latest thriller or or a mystery novel, you're not necessarily going to be annotating. even though I annotate everything, even even the stuff that I probably shouldn't be annotating. But you're not going to be writing, you're not going to spend your vacation doing uh, writing book bones and doing reading journals and final analyses of your beach reads. And that's perfectly fine. The Read Like a Grown-Up method is not a method you'll apply to every single book. You'll only apply it to the books that merit such attention. And because of, just because a book doesn't merit that kind of attention doesn't mean it's not worth reading. So just keep that in mind. Don't feel obligated to do all four steps with each book you read. Just do it with the ones that you really want to make a part of yourself, the ones, the books that you want to get into your bones, the ones that you want to assimilate. So the first resource that I have to help you continue on your journey toward reading like a grown-up is the Read Like a Grown-Up podcast. This is the podcast dedicated to teaching people to read in a way that opens their minds, shapes their souls, and transforms their lives. In this podcast, I discuss reading techniques, book lists, literature, poetry, philosophy, theology, and even movies. More importantly, I share the best from my own personal reading, thinking, and writing. You can kind of think of this podcast as my, as my own audio reading journal. I share the things that I've been learning from my own reading. You can check out the podcast at samconan.com slash podcast, and be sure to subscribe to it so you can stay connected and motivated to continue reading like a grown-up. The second way that you can continue in this, continue developing your reading skills is by checking out the Love of Story literature class. One of the very best ways to improve your reading skills is to read books with someone who reads better than you do. You can benefit not only from their sharper insight and vaster experience, but you can also benefit from all their previous reading. As they read any book, they're constantly finding connections to all the other books that they've read, and they will share those connections with you. Such readers have sailed deeper and farther on the sea of stories than you have, and reading books with them is one of the fastest ways to get your sea legs as a reader. So how would you like to have me as your reading partner? How much would your reading improve if you you could interact with me as you applied this method to the books you read? Well, now you can. You can read, study, and discuss three great books with me in my Love of Story literature class. Not only will we apply the Read Like a Grown-Up method to these books, but we'll also explore the function, meaning, and importance of story. This class will certainly make you a better reader, but it will also make you a better human being. Check it out at readlikeagrownup.com. And even though you finished this course, please email me with any questions you have, and I'll have an answer for you in 24 hours. As soon as this lesson is over, please send me a quick email and let me know what you thought about this course. You can send me any kind of feedback, questions, complaints, you can just, congratulations, those are always welcome. But I can't wait to hear from you. I'll talk to you soon over email. Lastly, if this course was helpful to you, please take a minute and share it with someone else. Use the links in the resources section below to share the link to the sign-up page for this course with your friends and family. Thanks a lot, and until next time, here's to your reading life.